This is the fourth lecture in the series, and today I'm talking about the post-Keynesian school of thought in economics. And of course, last week I talked about the Austrians, and they have the same theory of value as the neoclassicals. They they differ uh, at the when it comes to applying that theory of value, but the basic idea about utility maximizing agents, uh, profit maximizing firms, that sort of vision, and the market being an equilibrium seeking device, that's all there. Where they diverge from the neoclassicals is they emphasize the limited knowledge that people actually have of the world, rather than fantasizing about uh, rational agents who can accurately foretell the future, which is the neoclassical solution to some of their mathematical conundrums. Uh, the Austrians say, look, the people have got limited knowledge not only about the, the, the future, which is unknowable, but even about the present. And they apply that, that limited knowledge and the market actually works as a system that enables information to be processed and understood. And they focus upon the possibility of disequilibrium and the role of money, which definitely separates them from the neoclassicals. This week's The Post Keynesians definitely tell you the title of Now for Something Completely Different. <laughs> And now for something completely different. So, how are they different? Well, this is the Austrians and neoclassicals fight like crazy, but they've got an enormous amount in common. They share this idea that utility is the foundation of value, and adding utility to something gives it more value. Uh, they both use supply and demand analysis in various ways. Uh, they both believe in marginal utility. They both believe marginal cost rises, which is an empirical fallacy, but you can't convince economists not to believe what they wish to believe. Uh, marginal revenues roll, etc., etc. Equilibrium is the natural state of the market economy, and they have an a priori and deductive approach to economic methodology. They're starting uh, this wonderful word they use called praxeology, which makes them even more extreme on that front than the neoclassicals are. Now, the post Keynesians reject all of the above and much, much more about the, the approach to economics. And they do overlap with the Austrians on some issues, so they, have a, they share the idea that people have incomplete knowledge about the current situation and fundamental uncertainty about the future. They both see a role, the, the vital role for money in the economy versus the, the myth of barter that still dominates the mainstream, even after the financial crisis. But they differ on the fundamentals of both the neoclassicals and the Austrians, so that they don't have an explicit theory of value, but they lean towards the, uh, pr the proposition that effort is the basis of value rather than utility, etc., etc. They reject supply and demand analysis, though a lot of them still use something which looks a bit like it on occasions with equilibrium thinking. They don't regard equilibrium as normal, but they, again, there's a, there's a split or a, a range of approaches where some use equilibrium thinking and others don't. Fundamentally, their approach is empirical and or inductive, and you'll see that in Keynes's own work, which triggered the beginnings of the, the post-Keynesian school 80-something years ago. So the key question that I see as defining the post-Keynesian approach is, what caused the Great Depression and can it happen again? And the person, of course, who asked that question most cogently was Hyman Minsky. And the key difference with the neoclassicals is emphasizing realism versus unrealism. Now, uh, for to look at some of the unreal elements of neoclassical theory, Volrar had the concept of a, of a mega market where all traders and all markets came together and prices were ha haggled in, 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 over time for all the markets so that no trading took place until all markets were in equilibrium. Well, there were individual markets which played a, a, a role something like that in 19th century, 18th century France, where uh, prices for a single commodity would be determined by, by haggling and reaching an equilibrium uh, where supply equal demand for that particular market. But his hypothetical mega market did not exist, it's a mental construct. Equally, supply and demand analysis is an armchair model of competition. Um, the, the, the proposition that supply, uh, the cost of supply rises because of rising marginal cost is an empirical fallacy, but they stick with it because it's the armchair model they like. And the, the, this is something I've actually said for my students as an assignment. Uh, they be believe that it's okay to make assumptions that are patently false, like, for example, assuming rising marginal cost when we know empirically that it's constant or falling for most firms. And the justification or the excuse for this given by Friedman some decades ago was to say that truly important and significant hypotheses will be found to have assumptions that are wildly inaccurate descriptions of reality. And in general, he argued, and this is what Samuelson actually called the F-twist, uh, the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. 
that's been as regularly trotted out by neoclassicals today. Um, and it's just rejected by post-Keynesians on a whole range of good philosophical grounds. Uh, they assume equilibrium, of course, as well, and this is imposed on their models, even though so in, in the neoclassical case, two of their favourite models actually have unstable equilibria. They impose it using this idea of rational agents who can accurately work out the stable uh, path on, a, on an unstable saddle. Uh, but it's never actually seen in reality. I have to ask my students, you know, when would you, if, if the markets were in equilibrium, how would you know? Uh, Post-Keynesians look at actual markets rather than hypothetical ones. Uh, they don't use supply and demand analysis because it doesn't pass the test of empirical realism. And realism for them is vital in the sense that you don't want to make assumptions which bring in totally false elements. You can simplify, but you can't make assumptions that are false, which is what neoclassicals do all the time. Now, they do develop equilibrium models, but there's also people like myself who specialise in non-equilibrium analysis, and I'll be talking a lot about that today. The key motivating event for post-Keynesians was the Great Depression. And that was and remains even after the crisis we've seen in the last 10 years, the deepest and the longest crisis in the history of capitalism. And it followed a huge stock market boom and bust. And looking at the data, of course there would have been tired people, there were people at the time, including Irving Fisher, saying that what was happening was rational. But this is obviously a bubble. That burst. There's the index, the S Dow Jones index from 1920 to 2000 to 19, 1940. And you can see it just going for this classic exponential rise in the index. And then bang, it all comes to hell in a handbasket. And that decline from here to here was a fall of 90% roughly of the market's value. It peaked at 381 back in September of 1929. It bottomed at 41 points in June of 1932. Now notice one little feature I'm going to be emphasizing a fair bit in this talk. There was a the recovery of the market as well stopped in about 37 and went south again. And that's what's known as the Roosevelt recession. And I'll be uh, coming back to that several times in the slides here and in the argument afterwards. Nominal GDP virtually halved from 1929 to 1932. This is working with annual data so it's not as fine as the data we like to use today but you can see it peaking at about $105 billion, I think it was billion, back in 1929, and bottoming at $55 billion in the middle of 1932. So an absolutely enormous fall. And again, the recovery in nominal GDP faltered there as well. Again, the Roosevelt recession, there was a period where nominal GDP having gone rising from 19, 1932 through to 1937, fell for the next year before it recovered. The rate of growth of the GDP was as low as minus 23% in one year. This is quite stunning when you see it. Quite a bit of volatility in GDP before the crisis, diminishing, notice that. And then this huge slump where nominal GDP in 1932 was 23% below the level it was in 1931. And real GDP actually fell less because prices were also falling at the same time. So when you adjust the fall in, in, in physical output, was less than the fall in nominal GDP, but still substantial at 15% of GDP down in real terms in one year. Again, the Roosevelt recession. The recovery was going, growth was positive, and then bang, both nominal and real uh, GDP growth turned negative in 38 and then recover after that. Unemployment back in these days was measured by asking people, were they registered for the doll? Were they registered with an unemployment office? And when the boom began, when the boom came to an end, the recorded level for the, which the National Bureau of Economic Research still keeps the data, of course, actually fell to zero. So it's quite a classic statement. Again, notice these diminishing cycles in unemployment leading up to the crisis. Everything's fantastic, and then bang, it blows out to 25% or 26% of the workforce in 1933. And again, the recovery falters. There's the Roosevelt recession again. You get down to a level, it looks like things have got better, Unemployment has fallen to about 11% and then it rises back up to 20 before recovering in the lead up towards the Second World War. And there was mild deflation before the crisis. This is again quite intriguing. Notice the cycles in inflation, a huge dip caused by the attempting to return to the gold standard and then getting away from it. Uh, the period where there's a bit of inflation, up to 5% of GDP in one year, but then 1927 all the way through, deflation. <clears throat> then 
the crisis hits and you get deflation running at 10% per year from about 31 through to about 33. So a dramatic fall in prices and yet again the Roosevelt recession features yet once more. Inflation for a while between 1934 and 38 and then the 38 on a period of falling prices once more. Now this is the this is something I hope people take a good a good notice of right now. The government ran a surplus of about one percent of GDP for most of the 1920s, and of course the mainstream thought that it was good fiscal policy, and that's still the attitude of politicians today. So here we have the government running a nice sustained surplus, and then bang, what the hell happens? Crisis hits, and you go to a massive uh, uh, decline in government revenue, an increase in government spending. And that meant the deficits were sustained until such time as Roosevelt was persuaded by his advisers that the worst of the crisis was over, about here, and it's time to try to drive the government back to surplus again. And that's what, if you're empiri just looking empirically, you can say, well, that's looked like what it might have actually helped cause the crisis. Now, notice that the government was running a deficit between 33 or 32 on to about 36, but that deficit was of the order of 4 or 5% of GDP. Now that's more than is allowed in the Maastricht Treaty, but it's one third the level of the deficit that the government ran in 2009-2010. So even though we talk about the New Deal uh, as something big, the New Deal wasn't all that big compared to what we're used to now. Now before the crisis hit, the mainstream really didn't have a seriously developed macroeconomics. Instead, the mainstream accepted Say's law, which is this argument that general gluts or general slumps are impossible, and that crises, when they occur, are due to disproportionality, uh, one sector being output too high and prices too low, another one vice versa. So if you have, ex in the, according to this argument, you could have excess supply in one market, but there therefore had to be excess demand in the others, and the solution to the crisis was to let the prices of the commodities which were in excess supply fall. So for example, if wages were, uh, if unemployment existed, then wages were too high, so if you let wages fall, unemployment will fall as well. So they both go in the same direction. The argument being behind this version of macroeconomics that money was just an intermediary, nobody actually wanted to acquire money. Uh, people won't sell only to buy something again, so what they're doing by being in the market is simply trying to increase their utility by selling products they, they are currently own which should give them lower utility than the ones they wish to buy, so they improve their utility, that's the only reason you trade, uh, and that therefore means that each person's supply generates their demand. So you go to the market with goods to sell because you wish to buy, that's the only reason you've gone to the market. You're not trying to accumulate money or anything foolish like that. Um, so given this, all, uh, this argument, the sum of all supply therefore can't exceed the sum of all demand because fundamentally supply generates demand. And therefore, when you have a slump, it can occur in one market, but that's because the supply of that particular market, and I call it X, exceeds the demand at the prices the producers are trying to get. But if the price of X falls, demand for X will rise, and you'll get back to equilibrium again. Uh, of course, unless governments and nasty things like monopolies and trade unions get in the way. Now, this is Say's argument about it, and Say, uh, writing in France in the early 1800s, uh, wrote what he called a, a catechism of political economy, where he was effectively having a dialogue with a, a, a dumb but intelligent person, a, 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 a question, an uninformed but intelligent person asking questions and him giving the answers. So he started off by saying that the more purchases produce, the more they have to purchase with. So the more supply there is, the more demand there will be. In other words, supply generates demand. You don't have any issues about whether demand sufficient. And his uh, intelligent but uninformed uh, questioner comes back and says, it appears to me that if buyers only purchase by means of their products, they have generally more products than money to offer in payment, so there's going to be a shortage of money. Now here is Say's dismissal of this argument in a way that dismisses the importance of money in a way that you can still find neoclassical economists arguing today. So he said, each producer asked for money in exchange for his products only for the purpose of employing that money again immediately in the purchase of another product. For we do not consume money, and it is not sought after in ordinary cases to conceal it. Thus, when a producer desires to exchange his product for money, he may be considered as already asking for the merchandise 
which he proposes to buy with this money. It is thus that producers, though they have all of them the air of demanding money for their goods, do in reality demand merchandise for their merchandise. So nobody is in capitalism for money. Sorry, Donald, you've got it all wrong. Well, let's put a few question marks here. Only for the purchase, the purpose of using the money again? What about wanting to accumulate wealth? Immediately? Aren't there time lags in the system? Don't people put money aside for a rainy day, etc., etc.? It is not sought after in ordinary cases to conceal the money you're trying to accumulate. Okay. And then finally down here, they actually don't actually want money. They simply want goods. Nobody's trying to accumulate money. I'd like to hear a Marxist take on that. Of course, I know exactly what that would be. And then finally he says, yes, without doubt, the more merchandise that's produced, the more demand there'll be for merchandise. So there's never a problem with demand. It's always a problem with supply. And of course, this is still the the mentality that dominates neoclassical economics today. Now, I just, what I, one thing I find strange in the history of economic thought is that this was accepted as an argument against the possibility of general gluts, even by the classical school, people like Ricardo, where the classical school had a completely different theory of value to the neoclassical school, which Say effectively was a, was a precursor to, because Say believed that utility and increasing utility was the source of value. The neoclassicals rejected that, so the classicals rejected that quite explicitly. And Ricardo would say the measure of value is the amount of labor that goes into producing a commodity. So they have a totally different theory of value. And yet here is Ricardo quite happily accepting Say's arguments as to why there can't be a general glut. So there's no amount of capital which cannot be employed because demand is limited only by production. So the belief dominated the mainstream. Of course, Marx didn't agree, uh, but he was a, an outlier, clearly. The mainstream believed that aggregate demand could not be insufficient because to them, aggregate supply was aggregate demand, and you'll still find this case being made today. Sellers only sell in order to buy again immediately, that sort of argument. Now, of course, when the crisis first hit into 1929 or 1930, the mainstream reaction was, oh, well, um, apart from the stock market crash, um, the fact that there's rising unemployment must be because wages are too high. So if you cut wages, the crisis will come to an end. Well, a slight empirical problem there, wages did fall and the crisis got worse. When you take a look at the uh, money wages and real wages over the whole period, uh, from 1929 on, money wages were falling. In fact, they fell between 1929 and 1932. Money wages fell by over 30%. Now, real wages fell less because there was deflation going on rather than inflation, but for the entire period of the great, great right to 1939 almost, money wages were below the level they were back in 1929, and they were falling uh, all the way through to 1932-33, and real wages only rose because of that decline in, in prices there. But sorry, we had this, the, the, the mainstream would say that if you have unemployment, then the solution is to drop wages. Uh, well, wages dropped and unemployment rose. They're not supposed to go in opposite directions according to the mainstream way of thinking. So that's one problem. Here's looking at the growth rates, by the way, uh, starting from uh, uh, one year after my uh, empirical data there, the, the, the data for the absolute level, so I can do the change over a year, one year later. And you can see that nominal wages fell as much as 16% in 1932. Then there was a period of rising wages, which, which actually coincided with rising employment. And then finally, again, we have another dose of the Roosevelt recession. You're going to have falling nominal wages and, rise, and, and rising unemployment. Again, the opposite of what mainstream thought, thought, and it happened twice. It wasn't just once back here. It happened a second time in 1937. Now, Austrians will blame low interest rates for causing the boom before the crisis. If you go back to the first lecture and take a look at that wonderful keynes hayek rap, there's Hayek saying it's the interest rates that were too low before the crisis that caused a boom, and then the slump coming after is the natural uh, fact of going from a, from a boom to a slump. So if interest rates had been higher, there wouldn't have been a crisis. Trouble is, interest rates were high throughout the 1920s. When you look at the level of interest rates, the nominal rate of interest was above 5% all the way through and as high as 8.5% at various times. 
and the real rate never got below 2% and was as high, again during the, the deflationary slump early in the 1920s, as high as 24%. But generally speaking, because from 1922-23 on, and, and inflation was fairly low, the real rate was positive and often above the nominal rate because you ever had a touch of deflation. But no way can you call that a low rate of interest. You can make some sort of argument it would have been lower except for uh, if the Federal Reserve hadn't behaved so badly or some nonsense like that. But I'm sorry, the, the empirical case is that the interest rates were high in the 1920s and of course they got higher to some extent in the 1930s as well. So whatever kicked off the boom in the 1920s, you can't say that low interest rates caused that boom. Now, they also blame excessive increase in the money supply during the 1920s by the Fed. That's what they thought would, if they've got, they've got what they thought were low, low interest rates and they've got to be high increase in money supply during the 1930s. Um, of course, seeing the, 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 the belief that interest rates were, were, were low is wrong. Uh, equally so is the idea that there was too much money creation. Ironically, the new Keynesian economists, who are part of the neoclassical school, blame the Fed for the 1930s, but their argument is it didn't increase the money supply enough. And here is Ben Bernanke uh, in his essays on the Great Depression, saying that if you look at the monetary data for the United States, it they underscores the stinging critique of the Fed's policy choices by Friedman and Schwartz. And he says nominal money growth was precisely zero between 28 and 29, and 1930 nominal money fell by 6%, which he is blaming on the Fed. And he said the cause of this decline in M1, which is, this is money in check accounts. It's not money created by the Federal Reserve only. It's also including the much more substantial amount of money in check accounts back in the 1920s and 1930s. He said the cause of that was a decline in the ratio of base to reserves. So he's blaming the Fed for reducing the money multiplier. He said, much of the blame for the early crisis lies with the Federal Reserve. Well, okay, let's take a look at the data. Now the red line is the money supply that Federal Reserve actually controls, M0. And you can see there's not a lot of variation there over the, uh, over the period of the 1920s. Um, they may have been sterilizing uh, golden flowers, as Bernanke argues, but there's not a lot of change there. The change you really see is in M1, which is the amount of money controlled by the banks, money in, in check accounts, and a big rise up to 1920 to 1930, then a decline, and then a rise again from 1933 on until, notice again, a dip at the same time as the, uh, the Roosevelt recession. So the, the, the data doesn't imply a lot of action by the Federal Reserve. What's actually going on is clear when you look at the rates of growth. And here a very intriguing factoid turns up and that is that during the 1920s, M0 and M1 moved in much the same direction. So it looks like there's some causal relationship between the two. You know, changes in Federal Reserve money may be argu arguably causing changes in M1. Uh, and yes, it's also true that Fed, Federal Reserve money, which is the red line here, does fall from 31 and 32. So he's right to pick that particular point. But take a look at what happens after that. After the 1930s, the Fed increases M0 and M1 falls. So they're moving in the opposite direction. So what appeared to be a correlation over here, a positive correlation, becomes a negative correlation on this side. And your causal argument, if you had one, and his causal argument was that the Fed Reserve's money setting determines a, a, a domestic uh, lending by the banks, just doesn't hold up. Now again, notice one more phenomenon here. In the, during the Roosevelt recession, What's happening back in the 1920s reasserts itself. There is now a positive correlation between what's happening with Federal Reserve money and what's happening with bank money. And the Federal Reserve is clearly reducing its reserves, or the reserves that the, that the private banks have with it. So that appears to have a trigger effect over here. But at this stage, in the depth of the crisis, the Fed was trying to increase the money supply and the money supply was falling. So the causal mechanism that Bernanke thinks is there broke down. Now here, back to the Roosevelt recession, which I've hammered a few times there. And this was, Roosevelt was persuaded to attempt to return the budget to surplus after running those deficits for 4.5%, 4 to 5% of GDP early on, uh, which is seen as causing a massive, unacceptable increase in government debt. Because by this stage, unemployment had fallen from 
1932 at its peak to about 11% in 1937. And the Federal Reserve increased its reserve requirements at the same time and clearly reduced reserves in circulation. What happened? The economy tanked. GDP fell and unemployment, which was heading down and it hit 11%, rose back up to 20% again. Though I think this phenomenon was the point where mainstream economists basically fell into despair because here was the initial, uh, the initial downturn was way back here when unemployment hit uh, extremely high levels. It looked like that was over, the, the falling unemployment here, thank God it's all behind us, let's get back to managing the uh, budget responsibly again and bang, unemployment explodes. So you see this period here where there's a deficit being run up, about, up to about 5% of GDP. You go back into surplus again and something goes badly wrong with the economy. I wonder why. We'll talk about that in a moment. So here's the government trying to reduce its deficit and the impact was, and also the private banks and central banks, money both going negative and unemployment explodes. So I think this played a major role in why Keynes's views were so easily accepted because you'd had two crises in a row or what the mainstream thought was going to happen just didn't take place. So economics was in disarray in the 1930s, compounded by this return to crisis in 1937 Keynes' general theory comes out in 1936. It arrives and become wide, becomes widely known in um, America in 37. I think it, that's, that's basically the, the mainstream had no idea what to do. Somebody else come and tell us what's happening. And Keynes's was the most influential argument. And off they went with Keynes. And he argued the crisis was caused by insufficient aggregate demand. That is a general glut. Aggregate demand being insufficient to employ all those who wish to work at the, at the current wage, which is a heresy for the mainstream and for, for Austrians. And as Keynes says in his French preface, preface to the French edition written in 1939, it was a heresy for him too. So if you look, look back over time, for a hundred years, English political economy has been dominated by an orthodoxy. And he said, in that orthodoxy, I was brought up, I learnt it, I taught it, I wrote it. To those looking outside, I probably still belong to it. And subsequent historians will regard this book as essentially in the same tradition, which is very pressing because that's unfortunately what happened. But he said his point of view was he felt in writing it that, and other work that it's uh, led up to it and what he wrote and after that too, I'd say, and even more so, the papers he wrote in 1937, he felt he was breaking away from the orthodoxy, from strong reaction against it, to be escaping from it, to be gaming an emancipation. So. And this gives you a bit of a clue. You will find both the old and the new mixed up in the general theory. So he, what he attempted to do was to develop a theory of the macroeconomy, but what applied to the individual did not necessarily apply to the whole. And here he put it quite strongly. I'm chiefly concerned with the behavior of the economic system as a whole, with aggregate incomes, aggregate profit, aggregate output, employment, investment, etc., rather than incomes, profits, outputs, etc., etc., of particular industries firms or individuals, and he argues that important mistakes have been made by extending to the system a conclusion which is correctly arrived at for an individual taken in isolation. So his first point in arguing this was to say that there was a, a fallacy of composition in using microeconomic analysis about the labour market as a guide to what's going to happen in the, labor, in the macro economy, because he said what happens to an individual, what applies to an individual, does not apply to society as a whole. And there's recently been a wonderful example of my good mate uh, Yanis Varoufakis making this case uh, in a question Q&A session on English TV recently in answer to a question from this guy. And I do wonder whether he actually understood uh, what Yanis was trying to tell him. Ah, pardon me. Got to wait for YouTube to click in. In, in the country, total expenditure equals total income. The, in your life, you, you have a, a wonderful independence between your expenses and your income. 
So I, when you no, cut down I, on your expenses, your income doesn't cut. I, it's I not cut. But for the country as a whole, if the country as a whole goes into uh, a, a major savings spree, then its total income is going I, to come down. I, I, so your personal life is I, not I, a good I, model on which to base... <laughs> <a> <laughs> And if it's... We just hear from one of the of old, it's you, sir. So, looking at that uh, argument in general, at the micro level, supply, your supply and your demands are independent. You can adjust such things so that your expenditure is less than your income or greater than your income. And if you apply this sort of thinking to the labour market, this is the sort of analysis you get. You have a employment as the horizontal and the on the, on, the, on, the, on the horizontal axis, which by the way is bad mathematics, but anyway, the economy has been doing this for decades, so we're stuck with it. For real wage on the vertical, you have a downward sloping demand curve for labour, an upward sloping supply curve, and full employment is supposed to be where the demand equals the supply, and there's your equilibrium price. Now, if you have a, if let's say there's a nasty trade union that sets a reservation wage that's too high, what that means is, according to this model, uh, you're going to have the same basic uh, situation, but high price is going to be imposed by seeing a trade union action, and that gives an above equilibrium wage, which means there's more people who wish to work at that wage, so you get supplies now larger in the situation that is back here. But actual employment is going to be where that preservation price hits the demand curve, so that's how many people will actually get a job at that price. These are the ones who want to work at that price. And the gap between the two, which is up here, there's your unemployment. That's the microeconomic way of thinking about the labour market. And the micro-based solution is if you cut the real wage, unemployment will fall. So if the real wage goes down, so does this gap. That that falls, this gap disappears. And you'll also, as well as getting a higher demand for workers, you're supposed to also get less workers wanting a job at this lower wage. So here's a large number of workers wanting to work at the higher wage but a smaller number down here. And I think this deserves a little comment. Anyway, so Keynes's book opens with a challenge to that precisely that argument, and it's based on looking at the data and saying this just doesn't make sense. He's saying the contention that the unemployment which characterizes a depression is due to a refusal by Labor to accept the reduction in money wages is clearly not supported by the facts, and you saw that a short while ago dramatic fall in nominal wages uh, at the start of the Great Depression. It's not feasibly said to assert that unemployment in the United States in 1932 was due to either Labor being uh, refusing, refusing to accept a reduction in money wages or demanding a real wage beyond the productive capability of the economy. He said you have wide variations in the volume of, of employment without any apparent change either in the minimum real wage, real demands of Labor or its productivity. So rather than being the labour resisting change during a depression, it's, it's the opposite. It's more likely to be weak and accept changes in that period. So he said, these facts from experience are a prima facie ground for questioning the adequate of what he called the classical, we now call the neoclassical analysis. And notice the inductive side of this reasoning. Your theory doesn't appear to fit the facts. We need a different theory. Now, what he argued in reply, and this is again very early in the general theory, is that at the macro level, particularly when you're talking about uh, labour, supply and demand are not independent because wages themselves are a major source of demand and a lower wage uh, may mean a lower demand for goods and hence a lower demand for labour, so one feeds back on the other. And wages are also a major cost, but also that wage bargain is not over the real wage, it's over the nominal wage. And because wages are such a major component of costs, if you reduce money wages, you may also cause money prices to fall, leaving the real wage constant. So one way to uh, illustrate this, and this is not a graph that Keynes had, but it's just an illustrative argument. Imagine we're still talking in terms of the money wage, and we've got a downward sloping demand curve there. Uh, but what you face is a, a fixed supply of labour at that money wage. Any number of workers you like will work at that money wage, up to, of course, to the, you know, close to the population level. And full employment you now define as a point not a point of intersection, but a certain fraction of the workforce having a job we take as being full employment. Actual employment is lower. Now, if you want to reduce the gap between the two, which is unemployment, 
How do you do that? Well, the only way you can do it is by boosting aggregate demand. And you had to rely upon the government to do that because private investment was very depressed because they had low expectations of profit after the financial crisis of 1929. Now, Keynes argued in effect that the slump in 1929 was caused by a collapse of investor expectations. And here's his very, one of his two very fast summaries of the theory. So saying the theory can be summed up by saying that the level of output depends upon the amount of investment. And he said there's other factors as well. So output depends upon the propensity to hoard, monetary policy, confidence, propensity to spend, and social factors that set the level of the money wage. But he said of these factors, it is those which determine the rate of investment which are the most unreliable since they are influenced by our views about the future about which we know so little. So in that sense, very much like the way that Austrians talk about the economy, but from a very, very different perspective. Now a key part of this different perspective was the focus upon uncertainty. And Keynes gave a sort of negative definitions of what uncertainty was, uh, and I'll, I'll repeat those here in, in one of my lectures, I give a rather more positive explanation of what it can mean. But he's basically saying it's not probability. You can't reduce uncertainty to probability or risk, which is exactly what neoclassical economics has done ever since Keynes. He says in this sense, relate's not uncertain because you can calculate odds. Uh, expectation of life is not uncertain because again you can calculate odds. He said the sense in which he's talking about it is things like what's going to be the position of private well holders way in the future, which for him back in those days was 1970. And he said, about these matters, there is no scientific basis on which to form any calculable probability or whatever. We simply do not know. And that, as you've seen in my coverage of the neoclassical theory you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, is exactly what they avoid with bizarre concepts like the idea of contingent commodities that is part of, uh, of uh, De Bruyne's uh, way of hoping with uncertainty by reducing it to the same calculable status as certainty itself. But he said, okay, given the fact we, we live in, we genuinely live in an uncertain future, well, we don't know the future, we can't know it, we still are compelled to act, and we do this by, in effect, by pretending that we do have this sort of knowledge. But it's very different to saying, let's substitute the idea of risk for uncertainty here. And he says, what do we do? Well, we, we have uncertain, uh, we, we form expectations. We form them on a very, very fragile basis. And that includes such things as projecting forward current conditions. So we believe that we pretend the present is a much more serviceable guide to the future than a candid examination of past experience would show it to have been hitherto. We believe that the existing state of opinion is expressed in prices, meaning prices mainly of assets, uh, and the character of existing output is based on a correct summing up of future prospects, and this is the classic about falling back on herd, on, on herd behaviour. We endeavour to fall back on the judgement of the rest of the world, which is perhaps better informed. And there's a great video I linked here uh, with uh, a modern uh, behavioural economist about, about what people actually do when they're facing uncertain conditions versus the myths that neoclassical economics put forward. But given this fragile basis for expectations, this is going to affect the price we put on financial assets. And because Mark Keynes argues elsewhere that there's a fair amount of uh, uh, discussion of uh, capital gain, then a change in the price of financial assets changes your willingness to take on risks that involve producing investment goods which may have uh, uh, whose value, whose profit may depend upon uh, future prices of financial assets. So you get a very volatile basis for financial assets which therefore affects your willingness to invest your expectations of capital gain and that makes the economy itself unstable. <coughs> and putting this in a form of verbal equations, I'm not going to go too far in terms of writing equations in this set of lectures, but the basic prompt that he's saying is you can say investment is determined by expectations, current level of output, current capital stock, and valuations of capital stock and so on. And uh, that's putting it in a sort of equation sense. You can say investment is therefore a function of expectations, output, existing capital and a few other terms perhaps. Uh, and simply applying that just by using the initials of each of those uh, concepts, that's what we get there. I is equal to the function of E, Y and K. And of course the, the most important part of that is expectations because they're so highly volatile. That's what you should have in any particular model. Once you've got that model, whatever it might be, you're going to show income as mainly your income and output as a function of the level of investment, more so than anything else. Uh, and the consumption is going to be a residual function of income, a fairly stable relationship. And you have the ex post identity of investment and savings, which Keynes made a major feature of these 
attempt to be stock flow consistent back in those days. And savings being shown, therefore, as a residual function of income. So savings is what's left over from income after you've uh, gone down the consumption. And if you attempt to increase the savings, you may actually reduce expectations of profit and therefore reduce investment and hence output. So all those sorts of concepts are a large part of Keynes's thinking back in the general theory. Now there's much more to Keynes than I've covered here. This is just a single introductory lecture and you'll get much more from this in Kingston from, uh, from Deborah Mulemaz and other colleagues who teach macro. Uh, but the mainstream found this extremely hard to understand because they've come from the perspective, as I showed earlier, of a Say's Law idea that there can be no insufficient aggregate demand. Keynes is here saying there can be. How do they reconcile the two? Well they relied upon an interpretation of Keynes by John Hicks which was titled Mr. Keynes and the Classics. And Keynes, uh, he started this paper by saying that, uh, uh, that you know, it's a, it's a, the general theory is not your usual economics book. It's got a satirical style to it as well. But he said that uh, these many people look bewildered. And uh, looking at what Keynes said, conventional economists, which he then called classical economists, we would today call those neoclassical economists, uh, said they find it hard to remember they believed the things that Keynes said they believed. Uh, so he tried to reinterpret Keynes to make the arguments more consistent with accepted theory. In fact, in later, later life, Hicks abandoned this whole idea and admitted that what he was putting forward here was something he himself developed in 1933, long before the general theory is written, let alone uh, before he read it himself. Now, that's the story for a later course in economics with uh, Kingston. Instead, what Hicks asserted uh, that Keynes said was that money demand was a function of income and interest rates. Investment demand was a function of interest rates. Notice no expectations there. Uh, and savings are a function of income. So uncertainty expectations have disappeared from this interpretation straight away. And what he starts off by saying is investment is a function of the interest rate and a fairly stable function, once you can draw on a, on a graph, which of course is a major part of what neoclassical economics has since done. Uh, Keynes is saying that expectations are both crucial and non-rational, not the sort of thing you can easily show in a graph, saying that our knowledge of factors that will govern the yield of an investment, which is a major part of deriving the equation that Hicks puts forward, is usually slight and often negligible. And it would be foolish to form our, and when form our expectations to attach great weight to matters which are uncertain. Fair enough. Therefore, what do you do? Well, you extrapolate forward current conditions which is people, what people tend to do instead. Now Hicks ignored all this and developed a very equilibrium-oriented interpretation of Keynes in which uncertainty and expectations had no role, which is why later neoclassicals like Sargent and Co and Muth could believe they were bringing expectations into economics when they did uh, a very bastardised version of expectations called rational expectations some 40 years later. Now once you've done this, Hicks says, with this revision, Mr. Keynes takes a big step back to Marshallian orthodoxy and it becomes hard to distinguish his ideas from uh, Marshallian ideas which, uh, he said, uh, which uh, are not all that, all that necessarily new. So let us have recourse to a diagram and he draws what becomes the ISLM interpretation of Keynes when he first really called it ISLL. Uh, and how does he reconcile this vision of, here we are, go again, we're back to the classics of an upward sloping supply curve, so to speak, and a downward sloping demand curve, just like microeconomics, an equilibrium level worked out as well. How do you reconcile that with Keynes talking about the need to boost aggregate demand in some circumstances? Well, what Hicks argues is that Keynes's innovation is simply talking about the slope of the supply curve in this model, and that's to say that it's very flat uh, at, a, at a low level of interest and it becomes very steep uh, sorry, at a low level of investment and becomes steeper at a higher level of investment. So he draws a dotted line, effectively, and says this is the Keynesian region. Down here, if you boost aggregate demand, which is moving the, effectively the demand curve out, then you're going to boost investment and therefore boost output without changing interest rates all that much, not changing prices. Uh, but if you go on the other side, you're in the classical, or what we call the neoclassical region, where you boost demand and boost prices and don't have much effect on real output, which is what Keynes was trying to vary. So that's his reconciliation. And it was quite consistent with conventional theory, as Hicks emphasised, because, as he later said, it was derived from a Walrasian model that he was working on back in 1932 and 33. So it so shows income and the rate of interest is determined at, the, at a single point, uh, just like price and output are determined in the theory of demand and supply, so he's acknowledging that he's made macro like a version of micro, and he said therefore Keynes is like a marginalist. 
Now, this is the point at which post-Keynesians diverge from the mainstream. They saw Hicks's model as preserving the old that Keynes was trying to escape from, as he explained in that preface, and rejecting, rejecting the new, which is what he was trying to move towards. So post-Keynesians go the opposite direction. They developed, attempted to develop a new analysis based predominantly on Keynes's insights in at this period of writing the general theory, and they rejected the old stuff, which is the Marshallian. And again, there are many, many different strands to the post-Keynesian approach. One important part of that is an empirical approach to competition and production, and that leads to a critique of the whole theory of supply and demand. Uh, and one of the essential uh, empirical part of that is it is a well-known fact for the minority really in the post-Keynesian literature and for the minority of uh, economists that have actually researched this, marginal costs do not rise. I link to a particular article on that, uh, which is a survey article by two of the leading uh, developers of that particular strand of post-Keynesian economics, where they cite the research by Alan Blinder, who is far from being a radical, uh, who also found the same thing when he did a survey. Most firms don't have rising marginal costs, so the whole model of supply and demand is empirically false. Uh, now, they are pro-modelling. They're not like the Austrians who say you can't model human behaviour, etc., etc., uh, but they're aware of the, the, the you, you certainly can't eliminate the uncertainty about the future and trying to explain how people behave. And they insist on realism in how they model, unlike the type of unrealistic stuff you'll see in neoclassical economic models. And there's again, like the Austrians, a fundamental role for money in macroeconomics. And the approach I can describe, rather than being based on the, the, the very finely tuned models of an abstract nature of how different agents behave, they're more structurally oriented. They'll try to derive models which describe the structure of the economy, and out of that description, they believe the dynamics of the economy emerge. I'll show you an example of that later. Now, they incorporate ideas from many other sources, including Irving Fisher. And I emphasize Fisher here because one of the two major strands in modern post-Keynesian economics does have direct lineage back to Fisher. Now, Fisher, when he, uh, back in 1929, was the world's most famous neoclassical economist. And rather like uh, the, the, the world's most famous neoclassical economist today, Paul Krugman, he was a columnist for the New York Times. And writing, uh, actually speaking at an event which was reported in the paper on October the 15th of 1929, he made the statement that stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. So they're not going to fall. Uh, this is the, the way that the headline was shown in the New York Times itself. And he said, I do not feel there'll be ever a 50 or 60 point break below present levels, such as was being predicted by one of his uh, newspaper rivals, who was a stock market bear. And he said, uh, Fisher said he expected to see the stock market a good deal higher than it is today within a few months. Well, that goes down as one of the world's most prominent bad predictions because just a mere eight days later, the Dow Jones lost 10% in a single day, which was on the way to being almost half of what Babson was predicting happening in a single day. And over the next few years, actually very rapidly, given the, the fact that he was so highly levered, he lost $12 million, which is a substantial sum. Let's put that in a modern terms, roughly $110 million US dollars today. And of course, as well as losing money, he lost his reputation. These were trotted out to him when you search for Fisher's name. These quotes are the main things you'll find on the internet. And he's wiped out mainly because his wealth was levered using margin loans. Now, what you do with the margin loan is you put down a deposit, and back in those days you could put down a 10% deposit, so say in his days, uh, he, when he did his uh, margin uh, uh, borrowing, it would have been, say, $10 million. And with that, you buy $100 million worth of shares. That's where your net worth comes from, apparent worth comes from. Now, if the shares go up by 10% to $110 million, you make 100% profit on your $10 million deposit. But if they fall, which they did in one day by that 10% amount, and a margin loan, you are required to maintain the value of the portfolio at at least the initial level. So it was worth 100 million, they've gone down to 90, you have to put in $10 million to top it up. If you can't do that, you go bankrupt. He didn't quite do that. His, uh, his wife's sister, who was quite wealthy, rescued him from absolute bankruptcy. Uh, but in the aftermath to all this, first of all, in total it is a rain confusion. He ultimately developed an alternative theory to explain where the crash came from, which he called the debt deflation theory of Great Depressions. And he argued the two dominant factors that caused depressions are, quote unquote, over-indebtedness to start with and deflation following soon after. 
and intriguingly he's not the nothing like a writer like in Keynes's class as a writer but I find these lines quite poignant because he's really talking about his own experience so he ruled out the importance of other factors like over over investment over speculation etc etc because there'll be far less serious results when they're not conducted with borrowed money and believe me he knew about borrowed money so that is over indebtedness may lend importance to over investment or over speculation. The same is true as overconfidence, and he clearly suffered from overconfidence before the crisis. This is a wonderful line. I fancy that overconfidence seldom does any great harm except when, as, and if it beguiles its victims into debt. And he was clearly a victim. Now, his post crisis theory was this idea of having too much debt combined with low inflation or even falling prices. So he said, in that situation, the first thing that will start happening is let debt liquidation. You have distressed selling to try to pay, cover your debts, which contracts the deposit to currency because as you pay bank loans off, you reduce the money in supply and circulation, which is an extremely important point. And the velocity of circulation also slows down. That means prices fall, and unless you have reflation being brought in, which of course we're talking about again today, uh, then you have a greater fall in the net worth of businesses, causing bankruptcies, a fall in profits, which means those uh, concerns reduce output, sack workers, more bankruptcies, etc., etc., leading to pessimism and lack of confidence, which means hoarding. People slow down the rate of velocity of circulation of money even further, and you see complicated disturbances in the rate of interest. So a fall in the nominal rate, but a rise in the real rate, as you've seen from the data, or well, you will see from the data in this lecture. Now this argument Fisher put forward was fundamentally and explicitly non-equilibrium. And this is what is missed by neoclassicals when they read and either fail to interpret or completely dismiss Fisher on this point. He starts by saying that we can tentatively assume that most variables in a general way tend towards a stable equilibrium. Uh, therefore, unless there's some other disturbances, they'll progress towards uh, equilibrium, just like a rocking chair, once you set it in motion, will ultimately stop moving. He said, but the exact equilibrium seldom sort is seldom reached and never long maintained. New disturbances are, humanly speaking, sure to occur, so that therefore any variable is above or below its ideal equilibrium. And he said, therefore, theoretically, and in fact, factually, there must be over or under production, over or under consumption, over or under everything else. And the lovely punchline at the end, it is abs as absurd to assume that the variables in an economic organisation will stay put in perfect equilibrium as to assume that the Atlantic Ocean can never be without a wave. So here is an argument, you must model the economy from a non-equilibrium point of view. Now, one of my students asked me the whole question last week, uh, how do you model out of equilibrium? Well, the reason that uh, economists, most economist students don't know is that all they learn ever is simultaneous equations. Yes, okay, they teach differential equations in some advanced courses, but with limitations that I find in, um, in, infuriating. Uh, what they do with a simultaneous equation, which is the main tuition that anybody who only has an undergraduate degree gets, is you say, take one variable like demand, and say demand is a function of price. Take another one, which is also a function of price. Work out whether equal, you've got the equilibrium price, and that's the end of your, your modelling. It's the familiar belief that that's all you need to do, and of course it also assumes that the equilibrium is stable. But there's also what are called differential equations, and that's where you take the rate of change of the variable. Uh, for example, the growth rate of fish, which you can see is a function of how many fish there are now, because that will determine how many uh, fish babies get born, uh, and how many sharks there are, which determines how many fish get eaten. Uh, then you take the rate of change of another variable, the growth rate of sharks, which is also going to be a function of how many fish there are and how many sharks, and you see how the two interact. So here's an illustration of how this works. And start by the thought of how many fish would there be if there were no sharks? Well, the simplest situation is exponential growth. The number of fish grows by 50% per annum, for example. Now, as an equation, this becomes growth in the number of fish is 0.5 times the number of fish alive today. And that's what's give you exponential growth. So if we model this in my software package, Minsky, let's just bring it up here. Make it a bit larger, so you can see the equation there. We have a bit of a problem with our redrawing the screen still. Okay, so that's saying the fish, number of fish multiplied by the growth rate integrated is going to be the number of fish. And you graph that, 
and what you get, I'll slow it down because it goes too quickly, you get exponential growth. That's the simplest situation. And what about the sharks? Well, if there are no fish, then the shark population would fall constantly because, let's say, for example, that all they can do is eat, eat, eat as each other, and this, in this situation, the number of sharks will fall, again, just for example's sake, by 100% each year. Now, that becomes the growth of the number of sharks each year is minus one times the number of sharks alive today. And that gives you what's called exponential population decay, but like radioactive decay. And it's takeable. Take, well, actually, I'll just, again, for the sake of time, I'll show that quickly. You start at a particular number and then you decay towards, but never quite reach one in that case. So this model is going to be artificial in the fact you're going to have a, a fraction of a shark alive. There are various ways you can handle that with your programming, of course, but simple model, this illustrates the basic point. Now, what about how many fish there are going to be when there are sharks as well? Well, the simplest way to model that is to say, just say that the sharks have some numerical impact upon the number of fish. So fish population will grow at the rate that it would without sharks, minus some, con some number times how many sharks there are. And that's, for example, saying the number of fish will grow by 50% each year, minus 0.07 times how many sharks there are. And that becomes as an equation, the growth in the number of fish each year is 0.5 times the number of fish alive now, minus 0.7 times the number of sharks multiplied by the number of fish. So you get what's called a non-linearity coming out of that. You're multiplying one variable by another. You no longer have a model where you can separate the impact of fish and sharks from each other, as you can do in a linear model. You're multiplying the impact of uh, the, 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 the impact is multiplicative and therefore non-linear, which is the normal world. The world is non-linear. You know, equally for the sharks, what happens when there are fish as well? We start from the same basic idea. They'll fall at the rate without fish plus, in this case, some number of times how many fish there are. So you, for another example here, say the number of sharks will fall by 100% uh, per year plus 0 0.007 times how many fish there are. Put that as an equation, and I'll simulate it now. We put the two together. So I'll put the uh, number of fish up here, the number of sharks down here. You can see here's the basic population growth equation for fish. Here's the basic population decay equation for sharks. This is adding in a fish predation factor that reduces the number of, sh of fish, again multiplied by sharks by fish. And this is a shark prey factor, where being able to prey on fish increases the number of sharks. What's going to happen? You're going to reach equilibrium. Let's simulate and see what happens. And what you get is cycles. Watch. And what's going on here is that you start with a very low number of sharks and not a very large number of fish. So the sharks are starving, the fish are reproducing because there aren't much sharks to eat them. But after a certain level of sh fish population reaches, there are so many fish around that the remaining sharks have got lots to eat, so their population level rises dramatically to the point where they start reducing the number of fish, and the number of fish then start to fall, and after a while you suddenly find that there aren't enough sharks to, fish to keep those sharks alive, and on you go, a number of sharks will fall, which enables the number of fish to recover, and you go indefinitely cycling like that, as you can see. And this plot over here shows uh, the two variables plotted against each other. So you form this closed loop uh, colloquially speaking, known as a limit cycle, linking the two together. And that's classic non-equilibrium modelling in biology. <clears throat> so, can you get anything like that in economics? Well, this is a very simple model by an uh, economist who has probably regarded himself as a fellow traveller with post-Keynesians rather than a, a card-carrying member called Richard Goodwin. Is much more and is a complex systems theory, but I think it's the most appropriate model we can make for beginning to model a capitalist economy. And it starts from a very, very simple way. You start the saying that output depends, roughly speaking, on how many factories there are, capital stock. The number of factories, <coughs> pardon me, determines how many people you can employ. Employment determines the rate of change of wages, so there's a Phillips curve argument there. Output minus wages, and where, where wages are equal to the rate, wage rate, which is a variable, times the employment level that's also a variable, determines the level of profit, profit determines investment, investment is a rate of change of capital, and you're back where you started again. Now, what do you get when you put this in the simplest possible model? So I'm not trying to cover all the various complexities. So I've got a, a constant relationship between physical output and capital, 
a constant relationship between employment and output and change in the wage rate depending upon the employment rate in a linear way. So all I've got a, is just a, a linear Phillips curve saying that you know, there's a certain level at which uh, workers don't demand wage rises. Below that, they accept wage cuts. Above it, they demand wage rises, but it's a perfectly straight line relationship. Total wages equal employment times the wage rate. There's a, a non-linearity, just like with the sharks and fish example. Output is total wages, uh, uh, to, sorry, is, output minus total wages is profit. And all profit is invested in the simple model that Goodwin put forward. Investment's the rate of change of capital stock. What happens when you put that together? <clears throat> Here's that model in Minsky. And let's just make it a bit easier to see. I hope I don't muck up the graphics too much by doing this. OK, let's redraw. Yeah. Oh, well. Okay, it's not too bad. Okay, so we have the level of capital divided by capital output ratio will give you output. Divide output by output employment ratio, you get the employment level. Divide employment population, you get the employment rate. Subtract this employment rate from a rate at which wages remain stable, and you get whether there's pressure to increase or decrease wages. Multiply that by a constant telling you what the slope of the straight line Phillips curve is, and you get the wage change function coming out of that. Multiply that by the wage rate and integrate it, you get the wage rate. <coughs> Pardon me. Multiply the wage rate by employment, you get wages. Divide that by output, you get wages share, which I use elsewhere. But output minus wages gives you profit. All profit is invested in this simple model. Investment's the rate of change of capital stock. I'm ignoring depreciation here, but I'll bring that in the next model. What happens when you simulate that? Let's slow it down a bit. This is the employment rate, wages share here, and over here we have the cycle, the graph linking the, uh, linking the two together. And what you get is cycles, just like I showed with the fish and sharks example, the same basic structure. So this is a simple economic model that generates cycles, non-equilibrium behaviour. That's the sort of thing they're going to be teaching a lot more of if you come and do your economics at Kingston. <coughs> so we get sustained cycles rather than equilibrium. Now, post-Keynesians build both equilibrium and non-equilibrium models. I'm trying to wean them off equilibrium ones completely. That'll take a while. Um, but anyway, that's the, 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 you'll find a, a whole range of models done by post-Keynesians with, with different assumptions to neoclassicals, focusing on realism. I want them to focus on the equilibrium behaviour as well. A Keynes, Fisher and Schumpeter are major inspirations for, for post-Keynesians, varying degrees of varying post-Keynesians because they don't have the same um, shared canon in a sense that the um, neoclassicals or the Austrians have. And a key issue for post-Keynesians is what's called endogenous money, which was first originated by uh, the wonderful Canadian stroke South African economist Basil Moore. And also stock flow consistent modelling, which Wynne Godley, the English economist, uh, devised. And finally, the financial instability hypothesis from the American Hyman Minsky. Now, neoclassicals fundamentally ignored banks' debt and money before the 2008 crisis. I get them sending me models these days showing how they include banks, and I simply have to laugh at how they try to define a bank. What they're doing now is they're trying to include those elements of reality as another source of friction. So it's like another epicycle for a Ptolemaic astronomer trying to explain uh, how this particular thing slows down the progress to, uh, to equilibrium. Uh, rather than doing what post Keynesians try to do, and to that sense Austrians as well, saying that this is actually a source of instability, not a not a way that slows down return to equilibrium, but it's something that forces you into non-equilibrium behaviour. So post Keynesians, just like the Austrians do, assert that money is essential, but unlike the Austrians, they do consider the links between banks, money, and debt. For reading Hayek, you won't find you'll find lots about banks creating money. Lots about the Federal Reserve creating too much money, but very little about the consequences of private money creation in terms of how much debt gets created and therefore the impacts that has upon the economy. Now, the essential assertion that Post Keynes is making in contrast is that banks create money by making loans, same thing the Austrians or Hayek definitely agrees with, but that makes a fundamental difference to macroeconomics. Now, the mainstream says no, it doesn't. They say the banks are just intermediaries between savers and borrowers. And most of the time, with this being not one of those times, because they think we're now in what they call a liquidity trap, but most of the time nothing is lost by ignoring those elements of reality. And to just quote uh, that uh, modern-day famous post-Keynesian 
Paul Krugman, uh, by Post Keynesian Famous Neoclassical. He says, reading the comments in my Steve Keen post, he had a derogatory reference to me some years ago when we were both supposed to speak at a conference in Berlin for INET. I had an insight, banking is where left and right meet. Uh, both the Austrians, which is why I've mentioned them to some extent here, uh, believe that whatever market does is right unless it's factional reserve banking, which is somehow terrible, and the self-proclaimed true Minskyites, which means me, uh, and many others in the post-Keynesian camp, view banks as institutions that are somehow outside the rules that apply to the rest of the economy as having unique powers for good and or evil. And he says, as I and, and most other, many other economists see it, banks are a clever but somewhat dangerous form of financial intermediary. Okay, they're just a way of linking together by sellers and lenders and borrowers. He said, banks don't create demand out of thin air any more than anyone does by choosing to spend more. They're just a channel linking lenders to borrowers. And he then finishes with the a fairly disparaging throwaway saying he'll know if he gets a claim, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's the mystics who are wrong. Frankly, he's the mystic. He's a mystic who believes you can model capitalism as a barter system, which is as mystical as you get. Okay, now the Bank of England, quite in remarkably, last year came out on the side of the post Keynesians in this debate in a very strong paper called Money Creation and the Modern Economy. And they pointed out that bank deposits are created by commercial banks um, and the uh, bank deposits role in creating loans is trivial. The, the um, argument about the money multiplier is basically can be ignored. They said the and currency is tiny compared to bank deposits. The important element is that when a bank creates a loan, it creates deposits at the same time. When a bank makes a loan to one of its customers, it simply credits the customer's account with a higher deposit balance. At that instant, new money is created. It doesn't matter. Now, this is a point where the old concept of Occam's razor can come in. If you can show that this doesn't make any real difference to macroeconomics, then you'd be right to ignore banks. Now, post uh, neoclassicals do that by treating banks as intermediaries who simply introduce a saver to a borrower and then charge a commission to make money out of it. I've modeled a very, very simple version of this in my Minsky software, where I have households lending to firms the households then earn wages and interest from the firms and the households consume and the firms can also repay the debt. Now I've left out getting a, a, um, the, a fee being paid to the, the bank just to make it simpler to analyse. I can easily introduce that, but it's just to make this uh, simpler to look at. So what you get as an accounting table is this sort of flow. You have uh, the reserves of the bank which is where the deposits are stored, uh, the liabilities which are the deposit accounts of firms and households and the bank equity and you have lending of money being from the households to the firms, repayment of debt from the firm to the household, payment of interest from the firms to the household, payment of wages from the firms to the household, and the consumption from the households to the firms. I've got consumption from work from banks over here, but I don't model it at this stage because I don't have them having an income source. Again, it's just to make this particular model simpler. It comes in, in the very next one. So in a Minsky model, we now use a double entry bookkeeping flow uh, component of the model's capabilities. We have a model of a bank, households and firms down here. All these elements down here are defining uh, the, the various flows in the system. So for example, the interest flow, which is a payment from the uh, uh, firms to the, to the um, households in this case, is going to be equal to the outstanding level of loans multiplied by the interest rate. And you can vary the interest rate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how profits are determined down here in output and wages. Uh, yada yada yada, but that's the, the, the basic banking dynamic is what I've shown in the previous PowerPoint slide and this is showing it inside Minsky using Minsky's convention that flow from means plus and to means minus um, in the system. Now if I simulate this and I'm able here to change the rate of lending and re rate of, re of repayment, simulate it away Okay, this version of Minsky is a lot slower than the previous one, unfortunately. I have to do something about that. So if I change the lending rate here by lending more rapidly. Oh, Russ, we have an issue here. It's reset. I can't use it. Hang on a second. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this in a Minsky model. What I've done here is take a model that was published in the appendix to Krugman and 
Uh, it gets in 2012 in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, but it's drastically simplified. Is I'm just looking at. Uh, um, I'm not, not modelling banks being paid a fee, but that's just to make the diagram less complicated because it's fairly complicated already, as you can probably tell. So what I've shown here, this is, this is the, the bank table that I showed a moment ago on the PowerPoint uh, um, table. And what just happens here, the convention in Minsky is that all flows are a plus, from, from is a plus and to is a minus. So that's exactly the same table I've shown a moment ago in PowerPoint, but just done inside Minsky. Now, to show the uh, neoclassical point that lending and banks and debt doesn't matter, I can now in this model drastically modify the rate of lending and you'll see when I do that that the uh, level of debt rises as a result which is the red line in this chart here. So the level of lending is rising, level of debt, and as you can see nothing has happened to output and nothing is happening to the growth rate of the economy. And if we then have a change in the rate of repayment as well, so that changes radically, then we get a dramatic increase in the level of debt. Bugger all happens in the level of growth of the economy and go to another level, a drastic repayment, so debt falls and much lower lending, so it falls even faster. Uh, do what you like to the level of debt. You don't have any impact upon the real economy. You can basically ignore the financial sector. And that's the case that if no loanable funds applied, yes, you could actually forget about the financial sector completely. And that's the belief that the neoclassicals promulgate. So, there's forget about debt, doesn't matter. Now let's take a look at the real world. And we model that banks actually are the ones who are doing the lending. So what I've just simply done here is rather than having lending from households to firms, it's from banks to firms. And rather than repayment from firms to households, it's from firms back to banks again. And now, of course, there's an interest source for the uh, for the bank. They're being paid interest so they can actually do some spending. So not a lot of changes. So I haven't changed anything else in the definition of the model. Let's see what happens. Now we lend away. And notice immediately the level of money in the economy is growing because, as the Bank of England says, lending creates money. It's also changing the level of output and demand in the economy. And now if I have an increase in the rate of lending, you notice the money supply changes and also so does output. That rises more rapidly. A big boom in lending, off goes the level of money in the economy. Uh, repayment of that becomes slower still. Bang, we go almost vertical. Uh, if rate pain accelerates, you have a plunge in the economy and a plunge in GDP. This is, of course, a totally toy model, but it indicates the importance of including bank debt and money in your macroeconomics, which is what neoclassicals ignore and what post-Keynesians are working very seriously on right now. So that's the real world. That's why the, the, the real mystics in talking about bank debt and money are the neoclassicals, not the post-Keynesians. Another big trend in post Keynesian economics is what's called stock flow consistent modelling. And partially what I've shown you in Minsky has that attribute as well. And it starts in saying the economy is fundamentally monetary and all flows start somewhere and end somewhere, which is a classic quote from Wynne Godley. And what you need to do to see what's happening in the economy is keep track of those flows of both money and goods using basic accounting. So if you have a flow of X pounds from sector A to sector B, that means a surplus of positive pound X pounds for sector B and a deficit exactly the same amount, negative pound X pounds for sector A. And when you do that, you also add those flows to whatever stocks they're related to. So if you have a constant flow of new debt, for example, that means a rising stock of debt. And you can then estimate, well, what do current trends in flows indicate for the sustainability of that trend. So for example, if your rate of economic growth depends upon household debt rising 2% faster than GDP indefinitely, can this be sustained? Well, the answer is no. At some point, the households have to stop borrowing money, and when they do, the trend will change and your growth rate will change. And you can then make predictions about where the economy is going to go based on the sustainability of those trends. Now, this concept was used by Wynne Godley to predict that a crisis was inevitable way back in 1998. And the neoclassical claims that nobody predicted the crisis or couldn't be predicted are rubbish uh, when you look at what Wynne Godley and as I, I also did uh, using a different approach some time later. And uh, this, so the defence they're using now, first of all, if you look back at the neoclassical lecture I gave a couple of weeks ago, you'll see them saying there that, that we have abolished crises, they can't happen again. 
And when the one did, they would excuse now change as, oh, it's a black swan, nobody could have seen it coming. And that's classically what they told the Queen. And I think this uh, little uh, quote here is, this is uh, one of my favourite little videos. I want to make this much more famous. Uh, about the crash and what happened. It was a very prescient piece of video. Have a good look. I was managing my assets late one night when my eyes beheld a dreadful sight. The economy began to destabilize and suddenly, to my surprise, the market crash. It was a monster crash. A monster crash. No one could borrow cash. The market crash. It collapsed in a flash. The market crash. It was a monster crash. From the corner office and executive suite to the trading floor and throughout Wall Street, everybody came from their humble abodes to salvage what they could while the system implodes. The market crashed. It was a monster crash. A monster crash. No one could borrow cash. The market crashed. It collapsed in a flash. The market crashed. It was a monster crash. Wall Street was having fun. The party had just begun. The guests included Greenspan, Bernanke, and Paul Sun. The scene was rocking or were digging the sounds of the bailout bills that were making the rounds. From Congress, relief was about to arrive. 700 billion to keep us alive. We got some cash. We got some monster cash. Some monster cash. It was a Wall Street smash. We got some cash. It arrived in a flash. We got some cash. We got some monster cash. Whoa. Out of the coffin, a voice did ring. Whoa. Someone was troubled by this whole thing. Whoa. Whoa. We opened the lid to see who was there. He said, Whoa. whatever happened to laissez-faire. It's turned to mash. It's turned to monster mash. Out with the trash. There was a strong backlash. It's turned to mash. Wall Street was much too rash. It's turned to mash. It's turned to monster mash. Now everything is cool. It has gone as planned. And the bailout bill is the law of the land. In a few more years, we'll forget. And then, unregulated markets will be back again. Then we can mash. And we can lend out cash. The monster mash. Subprimes will be a smash. Then we can mash. We'll get rich in a flash. Then we can mash. We'll lend out lots of cash. Qua move, Merrill Lynch, qua move. Freddie Mac, qua move. AIG, qua move. Qua move, Fannie Mae, qua move. Lena Brothers, through. Bear Stearns. That was the guy says it all. Thank you, Martin Aga. And of course, that's not what the neoclassical economist told the Queen when she asked, quite uncharacteristically, when giving a briefing, I think, at the London School of Economics at a seminar on the crisis, if these things were so large, how come no everybody missed them? Why did nobody see it? And the type of answer that was given, uh, Gary Kino said that, well, we all were relying on somebody else, and it was a sort of slip through the cracks argument, uh, argues that you couldn't have ever seen this crisis coming. There was no leading indicator. Well. There were two post-Keynesian approaches that identified a huge leading indicator, and they were the stock flow consistent modelling I've spoken about a moment ago, which Wynne Godley developed, and the financial instability hypothesis from Hyman Minsky, which I'll talk about at the end of the lecture. And Godley, writing back in Challenge in March of 2002, of course he wrote in as early as 1998 on this whole concept, published this article, A Case for a Severe Recession. And you see that there are structural imbalances, talking about the relationship and flows between different sectors in the US economy, that make a deep recession likely. In fact, there's no natural process by which the economy will recover in the short run. Rather, it will require serious government spending to restore economic growth. Now, I'm sorry, I simply can't see how neoclassical can say nobody saw this coming when you see these sorts of arguments. And the sectoral balance approach that Wynn uses is divide the economy into sectors. The flow out of A means a flow into B. A's deficit is therefore B's surplus. 
So for example, if you have a flow of new mortgages, that is adding to the stock of existing mortgage debt. Now the flow implies that trend is unsustainable, so household debt has to rise faster than income every year to keep the rate of the current rate of economic growth going, uh, then at some point that spiraling will stop, and when that stops, you will then have a reversal in the trend, meaning that purchases of goods decline, imports decline, etc., etc., and the economy will stop growing. And that was the basis of Godley's predictions from way back in 1998. His argument was that there had to be a serious recession that would force the government to go into larger trade deficits, and the trade deficit would also fall because the lower level of economic activity would mean a level of import demand. Well, here's what the data shows. You can see that plunge in private borrowing that Godley said had to happen at some point, that he couldn't precisely time when. The government, which was in surplus back in 2002 and was crying about it, goes into serious deficit. After this, by the way, notice the level of deficit here, and I haven't gone all the way through to the depths of 2010. As you can see, that is roughly 10% of GDP, which is twice the scale of what was called the, the, uh, the New Deal back in the Great, uh, Great Depression. And the trade deficit, which was extreme at 6%, declines to about 3%, again because of the impacts that Godley was talking about, where the slowdown in the rate of growth of the economy would mean a decrease in the capacity to import. So how to visualise sectoral balances? I'm trying to work on a, a way of making this graphically obvious and my favourite trick at the moment is to say take a rectangle and divide that rectangle into three bits. Label one part the private sector, another part the government and the final section the economy. And one flow out of one sector is identically equal to the flow into another. So draw a uh, graph like this. Now if the government's doing, pardon me for too fast, okay. Uh, imagine the fiscal compact that the UK government has now signed itself into, where it's set the objective of running a surplus during normal times, as they call them. And let's just simplify things by saying, like, ignore the small amount of government revenue that comes from you know, the international sector and just look at government revenue and government spending being an interaction with the private sector alone. So what does the surplus for the government therefore imply for the private sector? Well, if the government's going to run a surplus of, say, plus net gov, then the private deficit is necessarily minus net gov. So I show this on the diagram. What you have is a flow of money from a surplus. If the government's going to run a surplus, its taxes, which means it's taking money out of private bank accounts, have to exceed its payments, which puts money into private bank accounts. So for the government to run a surplus, there must be an identical deficit on the private sector. And that's what I'm showing here. Surplus for the government of NetGov means a deficit for the private sector of NetGov. Well, that's reducing the money supply in the private sector. Let's just say, again, to simplify things, the private sector simply wants to keep the amount of money constant. Where can it get the money? Well, you can't go down to your basement and print it. So you either borrow from banks or you gain from net exports. Now, I'm going to ignore that for England and America because, of course, they're running deficits, so the possibility of them getting money from the overseas is, is rather, rather moot. Uh, so the private sector has to borrow from the banking sector. So you've got to take that diagram, as I've shown it, and divide the private sector in another, another half, called the top half private banks and the bottom part private non-banks. Then the government's still running a surplus, which means this flow of money from the private sector bank accounts into the government. For the private sector to keep its money constant, it has to run a deficit with the banks. So what a deficit, what I mean is that the loans by the banks exceed the repayments to the banks. So that's a flow of net bank. Now, overall, if the government, if the private sector borrows that money from the bank, so it's getting more money coming in from the private banking sector, such that it has a zero change in its overall bank account, then net gov is going to be equal to a minus net bank, and you'll have a constant amount of money. But that means a rising level of indebtedness to the private banking sector to keep the money supply constant when you've got the government trying to run a surplus. So a sustained government surplus means a rising level of private sector indebtedness to the banks, which was what Minsk, uh, good, Godley used to predict that a crisis was inevitable. And here's the data that he was using at the time. So he's showing overall borrowing by the private sector, saying this massive turn from saving money in, in, in the aggregate for the private sector, lumping banks and non-banks together there, which I prefer not to do. Uh, that kick down trend here had to reverse 
and he said at some stage it's got to go back here. Now, of course, we know events in 2000 to 2004 and the massive growth of the subprime market then meant this kept on going. But ultimately, out here somewhere, that's when the private sector went back into a surplus uh, in the sense that the level of, 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 of uh, private bank debt fell. Now, that's, that's one approach. The approach that I have used uh, is to model Mohamed Minsky's uh, theory of financial instability. And he was the one who asked that classic question that I think defines the post-Keynesian approach. Can a Great Depression happen again? And if it can happen, why didn't it happen after World War II and before when he was writing here, which is 1982? And he said those are questions which flow naturally from the historical record of the last 35 years. He said, to answer these questions, it is necessary to have an economic theory which makes Great Depressions one of the possible stage, states in which our type of capitalist economy can find itself. It was a brilliant piece of writing there. And he's describing his overall perspective. He said that there's one polar extreme view of capitalism that uh, serious depressions are man-made imperfections in the financial system, which is the neoclassical argument. The alternative view, which he was putting forward, he called unreconstructed Keynesianism, that capitalism is inherently flawed, being prone to booms, crises and depressions, and this instability is due to characteristics the financial system must have if it is to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. Such a system will generate both signals that induce an accelerating desire to invest and it will also finance that accelerating investment. Now he blended Keynes and Minsky together, and actually his original inspiration was Fisher, not Keynes, to produce the financial instability hypothesis. And this argument is, starts by saying, take an economy in historical time. Now if you're in historical time, there's a preceding crisis that you know about. So let's put ourselves at 1992, 93. There was the downturn in the 1990s uh, that led to the uh, successful election campaign for, uh, for uh, Clinton on the basis of it's the economy stupid back in those days. And in that crisis, it was a debt-induced uh, crisis, the savings and loans crisis of the 1980s, the stock market bubble and burst and so on. So the economy is in a slump after that period. That means both firms and banks are conservative about the amount of debt that they'll allow uh, borrowers to take on. And this is not a case of asymmetric information, which is Joe Stiglitz's way of interpreting this. This is shared expectations about the future on both sides of the borrowing equation. What this means is only conservatively estimated projects get funded, given the current financial circumstances. But the, since the economy has recovered from the crisis, most of those projects succeed. And since they succeed, both firms and banks think, ah, oh, we were too conservative with the level of leverage. If we'd taken on more leverage, we would have made a greater profit. So the accepted ratio of debt to equity rises, a higher valuation is put upon assets, and you get this self-fulfilling expectations taking off where, because you're less worried about a, cri a, a crisis, there's an increase in investment, and that causes the economy to grow faster, which validates some of these investments. Asset prices start to rise, so it's possible to speculate and make a profit on rising asset prices, and the money supply expands endogenously, as I've shown a moment ago. Riskier investments become enabled, some of which are losing money, of course. Asset speculation increases, and you get what Minsky calls the Ponzi financiers turning up. Curiously, I used to talk about Charles Ponzi, well, 20-something years ago. If I asked a room full of people, had they heard of Charles Ponzi before 2007, only a handful of hands would go up. Now if I ask you who hasn't heard of Ponzi, only a handful of hands go up. It's become much more common to think about Ponzi financiers after this last crisis. Now Ponzi financier is someone who's losing money on their investments. They've borrowed more money. The servicing cost from borrow the money they've borrowed is greater than the cash flow from the businesses they own. So how do they make a profit? They sell assets on a rising market. That gives them a desperate demand for debt throughout the whole period because they're repaying their interest bill with borrowing from other, other lenders. Uh, so they are insensitive to the level of interest rates because they simply have to have the money or they go bankrupt. Now the initial profitability of asset speculation drives up the supply of money and the d demand for it may cause market interest rates to rise but ultimately you have a whole combination of factors that bring this bubble to an end. First of all, the Ponzi's are necessarily losing money. So if they have a problem in rolling over debt at any point, they go bankrupt, and of course that has a dramatic impact on the economy. Uh, a lot of the investments that are undertaken in this period are euphoric expectations-based expect investments, as Minsky puts it. 
where they are simply ludicrous ideas about how to make money, they're going to fail. Rising rates can make a lot of conservatively well-funded, well-estimated projects effectively speculative because of the higher cost of money, and those non-Ponzi investors can enter the asset market to try to sell the assets to service their debts. And the asset market is nowhere near as broad as people think it is when the boom is going on, the market gets flooded, and the rising trend of asset prices ends. And in that situation, the very first ones to go are going to be the Ponzi's. Pardon me repeating myself a bit here. I'll look that slide out uh, next time I get, uh, do this presentation. So the Ponzi's go bankrupt because they can't sell assets for a profit and they can't roll over their debts anymore. Nobody will lend to them, uh, whereas previously everybody wanted to lend. And when the crisis hit, nobody wants to lend to them. Asset prices collapse. The endogenous expansion of the money supply goes into reverse. Investment evaporates. You're back where you started again in a debt-induced recession. So we're talking the sequence we've been through from 1992 right through to 2007. Now, in that situation, if you happen to have high inflation, and this was the case back in the 1970s and 80s, then the debts could be repaid by the rising price level. And what that means is the economy would grow, but slowly because there's a very little investment going on, but there's high inflation. That's a, a Keynesian explanation for stagflation, this thing that Milton Friedman argued Keynesian theory didn't have. And of course, once you get through that period, then the cycle will start again when debt levels are reduced slightly by inflation rather than paying, paying debt down. If you have low inflation, then you can't repay the debts. You get a chain reaction of bankruptcies and the economy remains suppressed. You go into a depression. If you have big government, and the government of the 1920s and 30s was small government compared to what you're used to today, then the anti-cyclical government spending can enable those debts to be repaid, and again, you'll get a cycle starting on the other side. Now, Minsky was ignored by the mainstream until that monster crash, and I've moved the animation slightly further ahead. But the explanation that Fisher and Minsky focused upon was this role of private debt. And if you look back at the data from the 1930s, you see this increasing level of private debt as a ratio to GDP at the same time as which debt was falling. So you have debt falling here. The reason the ratio rises is nominal GDP was falling faster than people were repaying their debts. Then you get this decline in the debt level with actually, uh, at this point, you get back to the stage where the debt's actually rising again, even though the ratio is falling. But then in 1937, this Roosevelt recession phenomenon, the private sector goes back into deleveraging again. So rising ratio there, a falling level, and then the Roosevelt recession. And my argument is the Roosevelt recession was caused by the private sector going back to deleveraging, given the government's attempt to go back to running a surplus. So can we explain all these phenomena using the, uh, the financial instability hypothesis? And I argue very strongly that we can, because these are some of the, the common phenomena. Notice the great the, the 1920s had a period of diminishing cycles in employment, unemployment, just like we've seen recently. We also had diminishing cycles in inflation, and actually leading to a period of deflation. Here's now looking at the change in debt and the level of unemployment. And to make it easy to see the correlation, I've turned down unemployment upside down. So it starts at zero at the top of a graph and is 30% down here. And you can see the debt change and the unemployment are strongly correlated. The correlation coefficient is about 0.8, or minus 0.8 in that case. I go forward to um, um, our crisis, can we see anything similar? Well, we did have, of course, a great moderation. And Ben Bernanke was singing, laxing, lyrical, laxing, waxing lyrical, pardon me, I'm getting tired of going too much work in the last couple of days. I'm heading up on a plane flight to Boston in a short while. So, okay, so waxing lyrical about how low inflation uh, in the last two decades has meant an improvement in growth and productivity and a reduction in volatility that they dubbed the Great Moderation, with recessions less frequent and milder, volatility declining as well. And he says the sources of this phenomenon are controversial, but he reckons that improved control of inflation, which of course is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve, is it contributed in an important measure to this welcome change in the economy. And then without warning, bang, it gives way to the Great Recession. So if you look at what happened here, here we have unemployment and inflation. Uh, more detailed data because we've got better data now than we had in the 1920s. There's the trend for falling unemployment. There's the trend for falling inflation. All looks wonderful until bang, the crisis hits, unemployment skyrockets, and inflation turns into deflation.
Now, can you explain that using the dynamics of debt? Well, here we go for the correlation now with the level, uh, so we're looking first of all at the level of uh, private debt and then the change in private debt. Notice not from 1960 on, even though there's drops in the ratio of private debt to GDP on various occasions, those drops are caused by a slowdown in the rate of growth of debt. It's still positive. The big thing that's different about this crisis is the rate of change of debt actually went negative. There was a period of deleveraging by the American public uh, private sector, which is now over. They're back into leveraging up again, and the ratio is now starting to rise once more. Now let's look at the correlation of unemployment and change in private debt. And I don't think I need to tell you that's an extremely high correlation. It's about minus 0.93. So again, I've done the same trick. I've turned put unemployment at zero up the top here and 12% down here. So you can see very strikingly just how strong that correlation, and it's not a correlation, it's a causal factor, as I'll argue in later lectures in post-Keynesian economics. Change in debt is driving the economic activity. <coughs> so, pardon me for animating a particular set of slides. So this is uh, the, the final phrases in a paper by me back in 1995, explaining a model that I developed in 1992 of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And I ended with what I thought at the time was a rhetorical flourish because of the very peculiar dynamics that the model gave me, uh, which were unexpected. I hadn't, hadn't expected to see it turn up. I had a period of diminishing cycles in employment and wages share of Apple, which was a proxy in this model for the inflation rate, before the crisis, which looked rather like a tornado. So I finished with what I thought was a nice rhetorical flourish saying, the chaotic dynamics explored in this paper should warn us against accepting a period of relative tranquility in a capitalist economy as anything other than a lull before the storm. Now, when I wrote those words, nobody dreamt up the phrase great moderation because writing in 1992, it wasn't apparent that there was a trend to that diminishing volatility in employment and inflation. This is the uh, nature of the dynamics that I exposed in that paper. And the horizontal and horizontal axes here are the employment uh, rate and the wages share of output. And the vertical is the level of money, pay money payments going to the banking sector. And notice this period would you go into what looks like a little vortex of a volcano and come out the other side. Now, can we model that? Well, it's actually extremely simple to do this with the Goodwin model I showed earlier in this lecture by adding in a bit of realism and saying that the Goodwin model presumed that capitalists invested all their profits, which means, of course, when profits are negative, they go around destroying factories. It's unrealistic to have a, an assumption like that. Oh, hang on. Pardon me, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. OK, that's why I'm going. I'll keep on going. You get this far, you're going to watch the rest. OK. Uh, capitalists invest more during booms than less, rather than just investing exactly what their profits are, they invest more during booms and less during slumps. Now I'm going to introduce that in a simple way by saying they've got a linear uh, relationship between investment and the rate of profit, which means they'll also go around smashing up factories, but that's why you bring in genuine non unit behavioural functions later. I'm sorry I'm rushing, but I've got to get a plane, so I've got to live with this mistake in the presentation. Uh, so what's going to happen if capitalists wish to invest more than their retained earnings during a boom, they are going to borrow money to do it. And when they want to invest less, they're going to repay their debt. So let's see what the impact that has on the dynamics of the model I showed earlier in this talk. So what I've added here is down at the bottom. First of all, I've also whacked in depreciation. So I've got depreciation occurring in the system, which I didn't have in the earlier simpler model. It makes no change to the nature of the simpler model without, uh, without borrowing. But here I have employment determining wages, subtract wages from output, you get profit. But now I'm working out a profit rate, comparing that to a rate of profit at which investment is exactly equal to profit. If there's a gap, then there's a reaction function. It gets a straight line relationship, just like I've used for the Phillips curve earlier, which gives you an investment function. Multiplied by that by output, you get the level of investment, and up you go to the determining capital as well. But now if investment exceeds profits, then you have a change in your debt level, and you have to pay interest on that debt. And that interest then determines the bank share, but it also has to be deducted from output over here to work out profits. So as well as taking away wages, you're also taking away uh, interest payments on the existing level of debt. So let's simulate this model and see what happens. And this is, again, there's no nonlinearity in the behavior here. This is all structural, and this is the point that post-Keynesian 
economists make in general, that you get the dynamics of the system coming out of describing in a realistic way what the structure is and including the important elements. Of course, one of the most important elements being the existence of a financial sector. So what you get is cycles that appear to be diminishing. Notice the employment rate is cycling away and beginning so that the cycles are getting smaller. Wage shares getting uh, diminished, cycling the cycles are getting smaller as well. You have a rising level of debt to GDP, increasing interest payments. But looking at it, a neoclassical might think, oh, we're headed to equilibrium. What's Keen bullshitting about here? Watch what happens. Notice the cycles have stopped getting smaller now. Notice also there's increasing amount going in interest payments, so the bank share is rising. Wager share is falling, so workers are getting less money. The society is becoming more unequal, which is a phenomenon we've clearly identified now post Piketty. And then on the other side, the cycles start to get larger. So this period of diminishing cycles, or what the neoclassics call great, the great moderation, actually a precursor to a breakdown. Rather than the Great Moderation and Great Recession being two separate phenomena, they're two sides of two sta stages in the same process. And when I include nonlinear relationships, I get much more realism out of this model. I don't get cycles up equal cycles up and down. That's that's a, an artifact of having linear behavioral functions. When I make them nonlinear, they all go down to the downside. But ultimately end up in a breakdown of the system. Now that's an incredibly simple model but it captures what we've seen happen in capitalism in the last 30 years. And when I generalize it more, even more so. So that's the sort of work that post-Keynesians do. So the fundamental case, part of the way you can compare the two, they're more realistic. Austrians and neoclassicals both have a priori, before the event, deductive logic is a major part of the way they, they reason. The Austrians doing a better job of it than the neoclassicals by far, but still falling over by a priori concepts. The post-Keynesians are empirical in their orientation, and you saw that in the early quotes from Keynes as well. But all schools admit important issues from the way they look at the capitalism, the economy, and the globe in general. And the main thing that they leave out is the environment. Now, I can argue that I'm going to be talking about incorporating the environment into economics next week and the next week's lecture, but really what I'm talking about is incorporating the economy into the environment. Thanks for watching. I'm going to get my plane to Boston.